Theater presents Lyle Betker and Gene Lockhart. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents The Criminal, starring Lyle Betker. And now, here is your host, Gene Lockhart. Thank you, Tony Lefrano. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray, pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, the Criminal, starring Lyle Betker as Alan. Did you talk to your father? No. When I got to the phone, Mr. Rivers was on the wire. He said Dad was in the library with a police inspector. This thing's fantastic. You don't really think Dad had... Of course not, honey. I mean, it's fantastic you should even be suspected. It's a misunderstanding, that's all. Even Mr. Rivers says it was nonsense. Well, now, there you are. If the president of the bank tells you not to worry, that's enough for me. After all these years to be accused, even to be accused of embezzlement... It's a mistake, Paula. And he hasn't really been accused. But the money's missing. They'll find who took it. Now get hold of yourself. It's just such a shock. I know, baby, but you got to keep your head. We can't help him by wringing our hands. I know. Did you tell Rivers we were leaving the club right away? Yes. Did he tell the police I'm your father's attorney? Yes, he said they wouldn't do anything until we got there. Okay, now stop worrying. We can probably clear the whole thing up in 15 minutes. Yes? Alan. I understand the police are still questioning him. Yes, in the library. Isn't Paula with you? No, she went upstairs. She's pretty upset. I can imagine. Oh, incidentally, there's been another development. Uh -huh. The district attorney's come into the case. Roderick? He's on his way over right now. Hmm. He doesn't waste any time. I'm thinking the same thing. How did he get a hold of this so quickly? When did you first learn of it? The bank examiner called me this afternoon about four. He might have called the DA at the same time. Even so, it's so quick. Almost as if Broderick was waiting for it. You think he might be trying to make some political hay out of this? Why shouldn't he? It's perfect. You're running against him this fall. Jim and I are your biggest backers. I know, but even so, there's no possibility that Mr. Gray no, would... No, but I'm thinking how it can look, or how Broderick can make it look, if he presses for an indictment. Let him press. We'll laugh him out of court. I hope so. Yes? I'm glad you're here, Alan. Mr. Gregg. Jim, come in. Sit down. How did it go? Well, uh, pretty embarrassing yet, I can tell you that. Someone looks you in the eye and all but says you're a thief and you get to feeling like one. Now, don't let it get you down. First of all, there's not a scrap of evidence. Yeah, the money's missing, Alan. That's evidence. I know if I were a policeman, I'd think so. It's a bad dream, Jim. It's a nightmare. Mr. Gregg, listen. Who could have taken it? Who actually handled the investment accounts? Well, that's just it. Technically, they were my responsibility. No, I mean the books. A vice president doesn't do that. Well... That gets us into a problem. What do you mean? Over well, the last three months, I've been using Mr. Jameson to handle those accounts. But they're clean as a whistle for the last three months. And that's what I was afraid of. It means we're up a blind alley. Oh, good grief, Jim. Was it old man Murray who formally handled those books? For the last 12 years, right up to the day before he took his pension. Oh, brother. What's wrong? If this man marries the guilty party, you, why... You uh, don't seem to understand, Ellen. We can't bring Murray to trial. Why not? He died last April... Heart attack. Oh, Broderick. You all through? Yes. Could I talk to you privately for a moment? All right. Let's go out to your car. Let's keep it short, huh? Pretty late. You're the one who's kept us up. Just doing my job. All right, so now you've done your job. 
I've let you fire questions at my client in his own house for the last two hours. Thanks for the cooperation, Mr. Michael. And you've come up with exactly nothing. I wouldn't say that. Oh, Broderick, use your head. I can understand a little publicity seeking, but not a thing Look, like... Look, Michaels, I didn't take the 200000 And neither did Mr. Gregg. The man's one of the foremost investment counselors in this state. He's got a spotless reputation. They all have until they're caught. It was Murray, his bookkeeper. The thing's so plain it's childish. Murray handled the accounts, kept the books... And then very conveniently died four months ago. What of it? I don't like it, that's what of it. The built-in patsy. The little man who isn't there. And who can't be put on trial. That's what you really don't like, isn't it? Now, don't get silly. There's no trial, there's no headlines, and we can't have that. It wouldn't be your thinking of headlines, would it? And how to keep your future father-in-law out of them? All right. I'll tell you what I'll do. I suppose no matter how much mud you'll have to throw, you're going to try for an indictment. I think I can get one. If I promise to withdraw from the race for district attorney, would you drop this thing? You've got me all figured out, haven't you, Michael? I think it's a fair offer. That's why you're going into it. I'm just a political hack. Night school lawyer who couldn't make a living if he weren't on the state payroll, now, huh? let's keep personalities out of this. I've made your proposition. That's right. And it's about the dirtiest one I've had this week. I think you know why I'm doing this. I don't care why you're doing it. You're doing it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Greg's as clean as a whistle. He is. Why won't you say it? Because I don't look at it the way you do. But you're just going to injure the man needlessly. You're making a mistake. I hope you're right. You won't believe it, but... I always hope an accused man is telling the truth when he claims to be innocent. Even when he's backing your political opponent? Maybe Greg never told you. Told me what? Twelve years ago, he backed me for district attorney. And he's only asked me to do one thing all the time I've been in office. This is a nice way to show your gratitude. It's the only way I can. How do you figure? The thing he asked me to do was a good job. Yes. Yes. Fine. Fine, Miss Wilkins. Swell. Okay. Well, I found her. Mrs. Murray? Yep. Oh, Alan, that's wonderful. Where's she living, son? Out in Rogers Heights. About ten miles from here. Under another name, too. <laughs> Henry. Well, that proves it. She wouldn't do that if she didn't have something to hide. You were uh, thinking of bringing Mrs. Murray in as a witness? Not unless she won't lead us to the money. Does she know you're looking for her? No. A private detective located her. He posed as a door-to-door salesman. Well, I must say, this lifts a load from my chest. Well, I'll say. One day away from the trial, that's cutting it pretty thin. I'm sorry we even have to go into court, Mr. Gregg. But at this late date, I, I do think it's better to produce her openly. As you wish, Alan. Oh, just a few more things. Now, uh, we're going to have to spar with Broderick for a day or so, unless the Murray woman gives us all the information right away. I understand. I'm going to drive out there as soon as I can, so I, I won't hold you folks too long. Well, ask anything you want, Alan. Uh, your annual salary is $25,000? Uh, plus an extra ten dollars to 12000 from investment. Uh-huh. Roderick's bound to try making something of this, so we'd better sew it up tight. By all means. I assume you made the investments of the sort that you advised the bank clients to make. <laughs> it would be rather foolish not to take my own advice, wouldn't it? I sure would. <laughs> Incidentally, Alan, quite a few of Jim's clients have offered to come forward as character witnesses. Here's a list of them. Good. You think they'd be willing to submit a list of the investments that Mr. Gregg recommended to them? I don't see why not. Fine. And, Mr. Gregg, have you a, a record of the investments you made? It's all in my tax forms. Swell. Now, if you can furnish those for me by the time we go into court tomorrow, I think we'll have this licked. I'll be happy to. I'll have them sent to your office this afternoon. Well, I guess that does it. Can I drop you anywhere, honey? Well, I thought we were going to have lunch. Can I have a rain check? Mm-hmm. I think Mrs. Murray's going to take up most of my time today. You expect any trouble from her, Alan? There could be plenty, if she doesn't scare easy. Yes? Mrs. Henry? Yes? Here's my card, Mrs. Henry. I'm a lawyer. I'd like to talk to you. Alan Michael. Yes, it's about your husband. I don't have a husband. I know that, Mrs. Murray. What do you want? I want to help you. May I step inside? Oh, all right. Come on in. 
Now, what about my husband? Mind if I sit down? Well, suit yourself. Thank you. I take it you've seen a newspaper in the last few days? You mean about Mr. Gregg? He goes on trial tomorrow morning. He'll be all right. They'll never convict him. The district attorney's going to try pretty hard. If he's innocent, they won't convict him. Maybe not. But they'll drag him through the mud, and even if he's finally acquitted, it'll probably ruin him. Why? Because there'll always be doubt in people's minds. They'll always wonder. You can't stop people from doing that. Yes, you can. You can prove someone else was guilty. I, I don't know what you're talking about, mister. I'm talking about your husband, Mrs. Murray. Get out of here. Now, that won't do any good. I'm trying to be polite about this. The insurance people won't be. What insurance people? The ones who have to make good that 200000 your husband stole. Oh, you're bluffing. I haven't got anything to bluff with, Mrs. Murray. I'm just telling you how it's going to be. I don't know anything about it. They'll hound you to death. They've been robbed. But I don't know where it is. Well, Joe told me once he, he made some money on investments, but it wasn't that much. Then why did you change your name and move away? I, I just wanted to. Now, look, Mrs. Murray. They can't hurt your husband anymore. But they can hurt me. Not if you weren't in on it. Well, during the last few years, Joe seemed to have a little more money, but it was just a little more. Then the rest of it's got to be somewhere. Well, all I've got is his pension and the insurance. His papers might prove it. I don't know where they are. He hasn't got any papers. Mrs. Murray, listen to me. If your husband were still alive, do you think he'd stand by and let an innocent man be ruined because of something he'd done? Well, I... I guess not. All right. But now it's too late for your husband to make that decision. Now it's up to you. Oh, I don't know what to do. Joe never admitted to me that he was stealing. But you suspected it. Well, I didn't understand where the extra money was coming from. He was a methodical man. He must have kept records. He... I know he was renting a safety deposit box downtown. He tell you that? No. I got a notice from them about two weeks ago that the box rent was due. And you have no idea what he kept there? No, but I... I found a key that I didn't recognize. Mrs. Murray, would you help me find out if it's the right key? Well, I, I guess there's not much else I can do. Excuse me, I'll have to change. I can't go downtown looking like this. Mind if I come in, Paula? Well, of course not, dear, but it's almost one in the morning. Well, what's wrong? Is your dad still awake? No, he went to bed about an hour ago, but I think he's reading. Has Mr. Rivers called? Oh, no. He's probably on his way over. Ellen, what's this all about? Come on into the library. I want to show you something I found this afternoon. About the case? Yeah. Do you want me to get Dad? Well, maybe you'd better. It's probably Mr. Rivers. Well, will you answer it? Sure. I'll go upstairs and get Dad. All right, we'll be in the library. Ellen. Hi, Mr. Rivers. What's going on? Come on in. I just got here myself. You said you'd located something in Murray's deposit box. Got it all right here in my briefcase. Paula went up to wake Mr. Gregg. They'll be right down. You think you can prove Murray was the person who took the money? No question about it. Ellen, I can't tell you how proud and grateful... Well, now, you'd better say the congratulations until you hear the whole story, Mr. Rivers. What do you mean? Well, this is an unexpected visit, Ed, Ellen. Jim, he's got it. Murray's the man. Is that what you were going to show me, Alan? That and a few other things. Uh, would you all make yourselves comfortable? Uh, how did the interview go with Mrs. Murray, Alan? Very productive. Now, it seems that Murray kept records in a deposit box. Very complete records of the money and what he did with it. You think the evidence is airtight? As far as it goes, yes. If Murray were alive, we could take him into court and prove he was an embezzler. But it would still leave quite a few questions unanswered. What do you mean, Alan? Well, I went downtown with Mrs. Murray, and we opened the deposit box. All I found were these investment receipts, records of stocks and bonds that Murray had bought with the stolen money. They were sizable transactions and very successful, too. That's strange. Murray was hardly what I'd call a shrewd financial analyst. That's the way it hit me, Mr. Rivers. So I assumed if he was a thief on one count, he wouldn't stop at helping himself to any advice that might have been available. You mean financial advice? Yes, it occurred to me, Mr. Gregg, that... He might have kept close tab on the advice you were giving to your clients and using that without you knowing it. I suppose that's possible. I keep such information very confidential, though. Of course, once the transaction is complete and the purchase is credited to their account, then Murray would know about it. He was the man who kept the records. That must have been it, Jim. That's the only way he could have done it. Well, that's the way it looked to me. But there was one thing that didn't fit. What? The money. 
That's what stopped me. The money itself had just vanished. Well, maybe he spent it. On what? His way of life improved a little, but not $200,000 worth. Well, he might simply have hidden the money in a shoebox or something. I thought about that, too, but it didn't make sense. He wouldn't have had to. Well, how do you figure that? Murray made enough to return the stolen money, or at least a lot of it, and still be ahead of the game, way ahead. So why didn't he return the money? I can't imagine. It would have been simple if he'd wanted to. Exactly. So the only answer that made sense is that he didn't have it to return. Well, I'll admit it's a puzzle, Alan, but it still doesn't alter the fact that Murray took the money. You say you've got proof of that. Yes, but I still didn't know where the money went. What became of it? So I got to wondering about those investments. What do you mean? I mean I got checking the purchase dates of Murray's investments against those of your father's clients. What did you expect to learn from that? Well, for one thing, I noticed that most of Murray's transactions were short-term investments. He'd buy a stock, hold onto it for a few days at the most, and then unload it, usually at a profit. That's not uncommon. Do many of your clients do that, Mr. Gregg? Yes. I have occasionally done it myself. Of course, you have to know what you're doing. That's what I mean. It takes knowledge and timing. Oh, yes, indeed. What do you mean, timing, Alan? I mean, it has to be done quickly. You have to know when to buy and when to sell, or you won't make any profit. Oh. Well, sometimes it's just a matter of hours, isn't it, Mr. Gregg? Well, it's infrequent, but yes, sometimes. I noticed that none of Murray's short-term transactions ever ran for more than a few days. I mean, between the time he bought the stock and then sold it. Alan, uh, what are you getting at? Well, I'm just trying to figure something out. Well, can't you tell us what it is? All right, Paula. I'm trying to figure out why your father freely gave Mr. Murray the same financial advice he gave in confidence to his paying clients. Gave Mr. Murray? Hello. Son, aren't you jumping at rather rash conclusions? I hope I am, Mr. Gregg. But look at these purchase dates and some of Murray's receipts. Now, here. Take this one, the oil stock. March 10th, last year. Now, look at this list of purchases that one of your clients gave Mr. Rivers. Same date, same stock. March 10th. But Dad told you Murray handled the records. That's right. But if this client bought the stock on March 10th, Murray wouldn't receive the purchase slip from the man's broker for two or three days. Yet Murray went ahead and bought the same stock on the same day the client did. Well, that doesn't prove anything. It could be a coincidence. Sure it could, and so could all those other transactions. Murray must have got the information some other way, in heaven's name. How? Can you think of any other way, Mr. Gregg? Well, not off hand. Murray stole it. What's the difference how, Alan? The difference is that I'm supposed to go into court and defend your father on a charge of embezzlement tomorrow. Alan, I can't believe this is you talking. It's not me talking, Paula. It's the evidence. Now, when I produce this against Murray tomorrow, Broderick's going to ask what became of the money. We've got to be able to prove that Mr. Gregg wasn't in collusion with Murray. Collusion? That's the word Broderick will use. Alan, I can't listen to any more of this. Don't you trust Dad? Do you think he's a thief? I think he's in trouble. Just because of the dates on those purchase slips? Not only that. What do you mean? Yes, son. What do you mean? Outside of your income tax forms, have you any proof of these investments? Proof? What kind of proof? Purchase slips, like Murray's and your clients. Well, what other proof would you want? If I paid taxes on the money, I... That still wouldn't prove where you got it. Uh, Didn't you, uh... Keep records of the transactions, Jim? Well, naturally, but I saw no point in keeping them indefinitely, at least not the purchase slips themselves. What about the brokerage house you dealt with? They'd have records of the transactions, wouldn't they? Well, I don't deal exclusively with one house. No matter how many there were, we could run them down. Well, to be frank, I don't always make the purchases in my own name either. If brokers know a financial expert is hot on a certain investment, it might cause a run on the thing. Well, what other names did you use? Look, Alan, it would be such an involved operation. Why is it so important? Aren't my own tax records sufficient? I don't believe Broderick would think so. Why not? Because the amount you declared as investment profit over the last ten years is very close to the amount that's been stolen. I see. Jim. Yes, Ed. Why did you do it? It's... It's not easy to explain. Oh, Dad. I'm sorry, Paul. I guess I always knew I'd have to do this someday, trying to make you understand. But why, Jim? Why? Because I was afraid. Afraid? Oh, not like you'd think. I wasn't afraid the way Murray was. You and Murray did work together, sir? Well, not at first. Not until after I caught him, I found he was juggling the books. When was this? Over ten years ago, I went to him and I told him he'd have to return the money or go to jail. Why didn't you report him? I I felt sorry for him and, in a way, I admired him. 
admired him. Yes, I, I admired his faith in himself. He, he had a system worked out, he told me, a system for beating the horses. It, it didn't work, of course. He lost money all the time, but he stuck by it. He believed in it. He was willing to back his own judgment. Did he return the money? He said he didn't have it, so I said he could have it to the end of the month. And then what happened? Well, he came into my office one morning about two weeks later with a list of short-term investments I'd advise clients of mine to make. Murray remarked that if I'd had the capital to make those same investments myself, I'd have realized a profit of almost 100%. Then he gave you the idea of cashing in on your own know-how. Well, he at least planted the germ of the idea. From then on, it was simple. I had him over a barrel anyhow, so it wasn't hard to make him play along. I see. You did the brand work, and he made the purchases. That's all there was to it. I guess you'd better call Mr. Broderick, Ed, and the insurance people. Jim, is there any way you could pay it all? No, no, Ed. You can't cover up a thing like this. You'd have to resign. Can't be done, Mr. Rivers. Embezzlement's a criminal offense. Alan, they'll send him to prison. Children, children, Alan's right. He's not. What matters is the money, isn't it? Isn't it, Mr. Rivers? Alan, it's it's the central issue. If Jim could pay it back... It is not the central issue. It's easy for you to be righteous about this. It is not. It's the toughest thing I've ever had to do in my life. Alan, let's stop to consider the consequences. What do you think I've been considering? Have you considered that you'd lose me? Have you thought about that? Would I lose you, Paula? Do you think I could stay in love with a man who sent my father to jail? Paula, Paula, you're not being fair. I'm the one who did this. I have to pay for it. All right, but won't giving back the money pay for it? It's not the same thing, honey. Your father's right, Paula. You like thinking that, don't you? It eases your conscience to let him sacrifice himself. Ease my conscience? Well, that's what it is. Haven't you learned anything here tonight? I've learned something about you. You and your precious laws and evidence. Paula, this isn't helping things. No, let her finish. What else have you learned? What do you mean? Have you learned what happens to a man when he's afraid to believe in himself? Are you trying to say that's what's wrong with you? It was. It was until ten minutes ago. And then what happened? I listened to your father tell us he stole $200,000 because he didn't have guts enough to risk his own money on something he believed in. That's not why he did it. Ask him. I was afraid, he said. He was afraid to trust his own judgment. It's true, Paula. And I'm no better. I was afraid, too. Three weeks ago, The night Broderick was here, I offered to pull out of the election if he dropped the indictment against your dad. You didn't tell me about this. Well, I'm telling you now. And Broderick was insulted. A ten-cent mail-order lawyer. And that insulted him. You you didn't have to do that, Alan. Of course I didn't. But I thought it would be smoother, simpler. I was completely convinced of your innocence. But I still wasn't willing to gamble on it. Well, maybe it's just as well you'd have lost. Not by default. That's the difference. At least I would have tried. That's what I've learned here tonight. You've got to decide who you are and what you believe. And then you've got to try. Does that mean you're going to Broderick with this evidence? That's what it means. Even if you know I'll never forgive you? I don't want your forgiveness, Paula. I want your love. Don't you know it can't ever be the same again? Maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe we didn't have as much as we thought. I thought we had something wonderful. I was sure of it. I'm sorry, Paula. Alan. Yes, sir? If you're going to get in touch with Broderick when you leave here, wouldn't it be a lot simpler if I came along and gave him a complete statement? Yes, it would, sir. I can dress in a few minutes if you don't mind waiting. Not at all. I won't be long. Oh, Ed. Yes, Jim. Uh, Would you like to come up and help me pick out a necktie? Sure. We'll be down in a few minutes, Alan. No rush. Alan? Paula, let's drop it. I'm doing what I think I have to do. I wasn't thinking about that. What were you thinking of? Us. I still can't completely understand why it has to be this way about Dad. I know. I I don't expect you to. But I want to. And I think I should. Because it seems to have something to do with how you'll stand by... What your heart tells you is right. I like to think that's what it is. So do I. Why should it matter to you now? Because after all this is over and I begin to understand why it had to happen, I'll still care what your heart tells you about me. 
This is Gene Lockhart again. I recently read a newspaper article about an industrial relations survey that was conducted by a well-known research organization. They sent out long questionnaires to the personnel directors of more than a hundred companies. What they wanted to learn were the main reasons people get fired from their jobs. Was it inefficiency? Laziness? Dishonesty? When they got all the questionnaires back and began to compare them, the research people were astonished. The answers sent back all boiled down to the same thing. The trouble with most employees we have had to let go is that they just can't get along with other people. In a way, it's a little hard to imagine a person being such a social misfit that he can't even adjust to working with other people. For that's exactly what the problem comes down to, adjustment. Not even the good Lord insists that we make a boon companion of everyone we work with, any more than he expects us constantly to shoulder our daily burdens as if they were a series of picnic baskets. We simply aren't made that way. And who would know that better than he who made us? But God does require, and each of us has a right to expect, that we all try to get through this world causing as little pain to others as possible. When we refuse to adjust to the imperfections of our neighbor, whether it's the man next to us on the job, or the telephone operator who may give us a wrong number, we are as far from loving God as the Pharisee. We are sounding brass and tinkling cymbal, and though we may say, Lord, Lord, until we're blue in the face, by our fruits he will know us. So when we suggest, on family theater, that daily family prayer is pleasing to God, we automatically assume that such prayer is offered up in an atmosphere of neighborly love and understanding. Otherwise, it would be a mockery for us to keep assuring you that the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Family Theater has brought you transcribed The Criminal, starring Lyle Betker. Gene Lockhart was your host. Others in our cast were Gene Bates, Margaret Brayton, Herb Butterfield, Ted DeCorsia, and Don Kirk. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your homes and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present Tennessee's Partner, starring Walter Brennan. Joan Evans will be your hostess. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America. Mm -hmm.